next part of this talk, it gives me great pleasure to introduce two Queen's nurses. So I think that's quite nice that we've got these ladies here today. So both are MS nurses, but do have extensive knowledge of palliative care. And I can't think of a better duo to talk to us about the subject of advanced care planning. So again, no pressure, girls. <laughs> Hello. Um, thank you for having us. Um, I think it's a real honour for us to be speaking uh, on the Nikki Abel uh, lecture. She was so inspiring and such an advocate for us all. So there's my disclosure. Um, so Ellie and I, both MS specialist nurses in the community, uh, we see patients um, in Huntingdonshire and um, we're a very small team, it's just us, and we're just one whole time equivalent between us. Um, and we have just over 300 patients on our caseload. As you can see, we've got quite a different background to lots of people who work with MS in that we've, we've worked in hospices and in the community for, well, the whole of our career, really. Um, so, yeah, that's us. i just point out that this is Miranda <laughs> as Jasmine. <laughs> I'm Anna and, and Ellie is Elsa. Elsa. And here, I'm a broccoli, and Ellie's a um, blueberry. We were superfoods for the super, super superheroes theme. <laughs> so just uh, to ask you all first, um, could you show your hands? Who thinks advanced care planning is important for people with MS? OK, thank you. And who regularly considers discussing advanced care planning with their patients? Good. And who feels confident supporting patients with their advanced care planning? Okay. So today we're just going to, it's a big topic, but we're going to try and uh, cover in some detail what advanced care planning is, why it's important, when could we have the discussions, and how do we start the discussion. And then we've got a nice case study that hopefully helps you to illustrate from our practice, what we've done with, with one of our patients, and then we'll take some questions. There you are. Okay. So, I'm really encouraged that, you know, everyone basically put up their hand when we asked who thinks advanced care planning is important, which is fantastic, because I love advanced care planning, that's why I'm here, that's why I'm talking about it, that's why I bang on about it to anyone that will listen. And hopefully that already means you've got a bit of knowledge probably a lot of knowledge. So we're not going into the technical aspects and all the ins and outs of what's an advanced statement, what's an advanced decision to refuse treatment, because we only have 25 minutes, and that would easily take all day. So we're just aiming to give a flavour of what it is and why it's important for our patients. So here we have the European Association for Palliative Care definition that it's about enabling individuals to define goals and their preferences for their future treatment. And really, that's what we do with all our patients. We are always working with our patients to identify their goals and to work with them on how to achieve those goals. And you know, that really comes back to you know, going all the way back to the absolute core, what is the nursing process? It's assess, plan, implement, evaluate. So we are assessing, we're identifying those goals, and we are planning ahead. We're just doing it in the context of what are the decisions that you might want to make if you lost capacity in the future? So what really I'm trying to get at here is every single person in this room already have, has the skills to do ACP. So the other point that I always like to make when I talk about advanced care planning is that it's advanced. There is no D on the end. You often see it written down, advanced care planning. And that puts people off because it very subtly changes the meaning. Because if you say something is advanced, it sounds like a specialist skill. It sounds like you might need something extra to be able to do it. And it's not. Advanced care planning is very simply the planning of care in advance. So, why is it important? I'm here talking about it because I really do believe it's important, because Personally, I have seen the difference that it's made to the quality of life of people that I've worked with. But we also have the evidence to say that. We know that poor communication is one of the key themes 
in complaints about end-of-life care in the NHS. We know that amongst neurological conditions, people with MS are the least likely to receive input from specialist palliative care teams, and they're more likely to die in hospital. And we know there have been... Um, there was a recent study from Marie Curie that showed there was a big survey on people's attitude to death and dying, and the vast majority of people do not want to die in hospital, and the vast majority of deaths are predictable. So we want to be talking about it. We want to be planning ahead and anticipating. So what stops us doing it? I think a lot of the time it's about our own fears. If you noticed our questions at the beginning, you know, nearly everyone put their hands up for the first one. And then gradually the numbers got smaller. And then the people who said they felt confident doing it was a much, much smaller proportion of the people here. And I think that's all to do with our own fears. I think we worry that we might upset people. We worry that people might think we're giving up on them. We worry that they might lose hope. And I think it also in some of us will bring up thoughts of our own mortality. But I don't see advanced care planning as being about dying. Advanced care planning is about living up until the moment that you die, and it's about living well and making choices and being in control. We are always planning for the worst, but hoping for the best. And we know that people with MS are likely to experience changes in their cognition, that may make decision-making difficult or impossible in the future. And we also know that communication on sensitive topics like this, if someone has speech difficulties, <coughs> language difficulties, may also become more difficult in the future. And it's up to us to bring it up with our patients, because some people will come out and say, right, what about what happens if? But a lot of people don't know that they have the power and the ability to make decisions in advance. So if we don't let them know that they're allowed to make those decisions and set out their wishes now, then they're not going to do it. So the next slide is all about when can an advanced care planning conversation take place. And basically, it's any time. There is no time that's the wrong time because we all have things that are important to us. Every single person in this room has got things that are important to them. And there are probably things that if we suddenly were unable to express our wishes for ourselves, we would want the people looking after us, after us to know. And advanced care planning is not something you sit down and do. You don't sit down and with a, your patient and go, right, we've written your advanced care plan, we'll put it in a drawer, forget about it, that's done now. Advanced care planning is a process. You might introduce the topic one day and then you might revisit it and you might come back to it because people's priorities and their hopes and their wishes change over time as we go through different phases in our life. We all change our opinions. So it's a process and it can happen at any point. But having said that, there are some points where if we haven't already started that conversation, we really ought to. And this is a tool that can help with identifying those points. So in end-of-life care, we talk about end-of-life as being the last year of life, approximately. Now, obviously, we don't have crystal balls. We don't have an expiry date, so we can't exactly know when the last year of life is. But there are a few things that can give us a hint that maybe that's where things are going. So we're looking out for things like the unplanned hospital admissions. You know, if you're getting more than one or two or three in a year, then now's the time when you really not need to start thinking about where this is going. If we're having more deterioration, if someone is becoming sleepier, if they're spending more time asleep than awake, then these are things that might trigger us to think. And this tool, the Supportive and Palliative Care Indicators tool, that's available online, there's a web address there. As well as these general indicators, it also gives us some specific indicators for neurological conditions. So again, hopefully, we might have already had some introduction to these conversations, but if you're starting to see these issues, if you've got increasing difficulty with speech problems, if you're getting aspiration pneumonia, 
that's the time when we really need to be triggering these conversations. Now, we know that everybody here is under pressure. It's a, a theme that comes through everything. And we know that it can be very difficult to find the time for these conversations. And there are lots and lots of really good resources for advanced care planning out there. You know, there's information from Macmillan, there's information from the Alzheimer's Society, the MND Association has some brilliant information. But there wasn't anything specifically for people with MS, certainly not that we found and we did look for it. So Sarah and I, we kept saying, I wish there was a booklet. Mm -hmm. It'd be really good if we had a booklet that we could give people with MS. And there's, you know, so we've got booklets for everything. We've got booklets for bladder and bowels. We've got booklets for sex. We've got booklets for you know, everything that you can think of, but not advanced care planning. So after we'd said that for a while, a few years, few years <laughs> yeah, we eventually went, well, maybe we ought to make one then, seeing as we're saying there needs to be one. So I fired off an email to the MS Trust saying, would you be interested? And we very, very quickly got a response saying, yes, please. Within a few minutes. Yes. <laughs> so we started putting one together. And it, we did a draft. It went out for review to, to peers and to patient groups. And the result is this. So this is now available. <laughs> And I think it's fair to say we're very proud of it. We are. <laughs> <laughs> and what we want to say is if you just do one thing, if you got that five minutes, if your patient is giving you cues that maybe this is something that's on their mind, if you're picking up <coughs> those triggers that makes you think this is the time to talk about advanced care planning, then you know, at least hand out a booklet. So you can order it free from the MS Trust website. There are digital and hard copies available. And I think Sarah is just going to say a little bit about the feedback we've had for it. So we've had some very good, good feedback. Um, and actually, the MS Trust, they took about 300 copies to the conference. 600. and they, 600 copies, and they all went. They've had to reprint uh, print them. And it just shows that our patients want to talk about the future, and we want to talk about the future with our patients. But it's just having those tools. And we, we often just, um, you know, we have patients who we know aren't quite at the stage of accepting that they might want to think about the future. And we'll just sort of say, look, we've just had this book published from the MS Trust. We'll leave it with you just to read. And that's a starting point. And then, as you can see, one of my patients, you know, said, oh, you know, although it's a sad topic, my husband even asked me what I'd like playing at the funeral. And it just got them talking. And she said, we don't normally talk about that. So it just starts the conversation almost. And it's useful for... All of us, actually, yeah. It's good information. <clears throat> so, again, just thinking about that confidence in having the conversation. It's, again, saying it's not a high pressure, this is your one opportunity, you must get this done. It's a process, you can revisit this conversation. And as you do it, and you will find, you know, some patients don't want to do advanced care planning. Mm. And that's absolutely fine. And you'll sort of introduce the topic and they'll go, oh, no, no, I don't want to think about that. And that's fine. There's no law that says you have to do it. But more often than not, in my experience, people respond to it very positively. And the more you do it, the braver you will get with it. So that's my big message is, you know, be brave, start the conversation. And the more you do it, the easier it will get. And the more you get tuned into it, the more you will pick up those really subtle cues that our patients give us, that they are thinking about this, that there's something churning away in the back of their mind about it. So I went to see a lady earlier this week who is, has got very advanced MS. And suddenly, sort of in the middle of a conversation about something completely different, she said, oh, oh, I know what I wanted to ask you. How do I give my brain to the MS Society? And, you know, that's obviously something that had been on her mind. And obviously you gave her the information about that. But then we just explored that a little bit further because 
So, OK, so she's thinking about a time, you know, when her brain will be available for research. And we ended up having a really useful conversation because she knows that her cognition is changing. She's having more and more memory issues. And she, we talked about setting up a lasting power of attorney and we talked about preferences and we talked about wishes. And it was all because she'd made that comment about, I want to donate my brain. And it would have been very easy to just say, oh, this is how you do it, and move on. But actually, it turned into a really very useful conversation. And that gives her that confidence now that she knows she can do these things and she can set up plans for the future and have her wishes followed. So that's how advanced care planning you know, makes a difference to that person right now because it... You know, it gives, we, I said earlier about how we worry sometimes if we talk about the future, patients lose hope. And hope is a, it's a really interesting topic in palliative care, and I can also mm -hmm. talk about that for a really long time. <laughs> but again, hope changes. So we can, we all have hopes for the future, and our hopes change. And sometimes what we're hoping for is dignity and control of as our health changes and I am uniquely qualified to talk about hope because hope is my middle name <laughs> <laughs> my parents really thought ahead there <laughs> okay so this is the case study and, and we've obviously changed the names but um, Tom's a 76 year old man and has had MS for a long time with secondary progressive MS now his wife is Jane and she's his sole carer. And we only, um, he only came to our caseload in 2013. And he was already a wheelchair user and, uh, and had poor memory. And what we're hoping that you can see from this case study is the moments of time when we, you may have picked up and been able to have started those conversations. So, you know, so here, he already had memory issues. So it may have been that we should have started the conversation straight away. But certainly, deterioration in his memory here, and we did give him a, a booklet. That was the booklet we used to use before we wrote this one. Um, and we talked about lasting power of attorney. But other times, you know, he was having difficulties in swallow. Um, he, he, here, he was very frail. He had a diagnosis of mixed dementia. He was having a hospital bed. He had poor skin integrity. Um, in repeated chest infections, and here he was staying in bed for most of the time. So although we picked it up quite quickly, any, any other professional may have not seen it there, but they may have picked it up here. Okay. And I just wanted to read something from, from this episode of care, and, and it's directly from the notes from um, Ellie. Ellie saw them at that time. And, it, and hopefully it just illustrates things to you. So it's a conversation with Jane. And she said that um, she'd found Tom's recent hospital admission very difficult, as Tom had said repeatedly that he didn't want to go to hospital. And she felt that he only agreed in the end because he felt that it was the ambulance man that wanted him to go in. We discussed some of the things that she had, has described, such as Tom sleeping more um, and wanting to be asleep more, more than awake. Um, having less interest in sleeping and more frequent infections may indicate that someone is approaching the end phase of their life. Tom now chooses not to get up and is being cared for in bed full time as he is unable to support himself upright in his chair and he is more comfortable in bed. We discussed how Tom has, has a respect form now, Ellie did the respect form at that visit, indicating that CPR would not be recommended. Jane is very relieved to have this in place. We discussed whether she felt that Tom's priority would be comfort or to prolong life. Jane feels very strongly that John wants to remain at home and comfort is his priority. She feels that he would not want to be admitted to hospital in future unless it is for, for something like an acute injury that couldn't be managed at home. We discussed treating symptoms that cause distress at home, for example, recent chest inf infections, and, just, and we uh, ordered some just-in-case medications. 
Jane said that she feels lighter following this conversation as she was worried about Tom being put under pressure to be admitted when it's not really what he wants. And she now feels that she can seek help when Tom need, does develop an infection or something without feeling pressured as well that, she, that he would need to be admitted. Um, but having said that, he perked up. <laughs> and, and this is the thing. Even though he perked up, Jane still felt that sh she was happy with his comfort levels and she felt able to look after him at home. And she, and she felt that she could call for help without um, having that pressure that somebody would come in and say, we're going to take him to hospital because the paperwork was all, already there. So we kept in touch with her and we, we knew, you know, that, that she knew how to get hold of us and we, we, we contacted her by email periodically. And I think it's difficult with patients with MS. It's not as clear cut as it is sometimes with patients with cancer and things like that, in that they do get very sick and we think they may die and then they, they perk up again. And we probably wouldn't have been surprised if he'd actually died back in 2019, but he kept going. And he died peace peacefully earlier this month. And, uh, and well, <laughs> Jane said to us that, uh, you know, she felt that she'd hit the, hit the jackpot by, by moving into our area, which was very mean, you know, meant a lot for us. And, and also that, you know, all of the MGT that worked with her, district nurses, OTs, physios, um, GP, obviously, speech and language, dietitian, and she was so grateful for us all to have managed her them, supported them in the home. <clears throat> Over to you. So, to wrap up, <clears throat> none of us know what's around the corner, whether we have a serious illness or not. And advanced care planning is about taking control of your own future and letting your wishes be known, because if your wishes aren't known, then we can't possibly follow them. If you do just one thing, have a booklet. <laughs> so... You can order them, get your orders in, <laughs> and people want to talk about these things, mm. and it is our job as their MS nurses to let them know that they can and that they have the power to make these decisions. Thank you. <laughs>